It's Monday night. I've been in the game a long time. When a catcher catches the ball and it's strike three, you call the guy out. It's that simple, isn't it? And if it's Monday, it's the knee jerks. I'm not going to sit here and rip umpires. But you saw what you saw, clearly saw what you saw. I just saw it for the tenth time. Write it and say something once in a while. Have the nerve to say something. Detroit Sports Talk with Attitude. Attitude on three. One, two, three. Attitude. Coming up tonight, will Big Al guess whose birthday it is? Who are the jerks of the week? What will Eno rant about now? The answer's coming up next. Two guys who know Detroit sports. The voice of reason, Greg Eno and Big Al Beaton. February 11th, 2018. It's cold as hell in a snowbound Michigan. Regardless, that means it's time for the Knee Jerks, Detroit Sports Talk with Eno and Big Al. I'm the Big Al of the Equation, longtime Detroit-based podcaster and blogger. Joining me as always is my co-conspirator, my co-host, my, uh, uh, I, I guess I can come, maybe he's co-dependent as well. I'm not sure about <laughs> that yet. And that would be Greg Eno. Greg, what's up? Well, everything's uh, fine here, Al Beaton. Thanks for asking. Uh, it's been uh, we're now finally back on track in the every other week uh, thing. Nobody's sick. Nobody's out of town. Nobody's this. Nobody's that. There's no uh, holidays, so we're hopefully we'll get back into a rhythm here. I am Greg Eno from uh, a WordPress Out of Bounds blog. You can check me out there. Also, my Winged Wheeler blog, also on WordPress. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Greg Eno. Follow the Knee Jerks on Twitter at the Knee Jerks. And our Facebook uh, fan page is facebook.com slash the knee jerks. We also have a group there called simply and aptly uh, the knee jerks group. So you can find us uh, on social media that way as well. Uh, come come over and say hi, hello. Um, we've got uh, no guests tonight, just uh, um, Al and me uh, pontificating. We've got a number of things to talk about with a couple of uh, items that broke not long after we did our last show. As a matter of fact, the one item we're going to talk about, the Blake Griffin trade, happened, I think, the next day after we recorded our last show. So uh, we're getting a little bit late to the party there, but we'll still talk about it. We've got some uh, Lions, of course, to talk about the new coach uh, and so forth and some other goodies that Al's got. Uh, and Al's going to tell you right now how you can get a hold of the podcast other than the way you're listening to it right now. As always, we are available on the Mothership, Blog Talk Radio. Uh, the shortcut to the homepage for us on Blog Talk Radio is thekneejerks.net. As always, we are on iTunes. Just do the search for The Knee Jerks, Eno, and Big Al. We're on Stitcher Radio, which is available pretty much on every Android, iOS, and computer desktop. Uh, that would be Stitcher Radio. Again, search us as The Knee Jerks, Eno, and Big Al. Uh, Stitcher is my personal preferred podcast listening application. That's where I listen to my podcast. So I highly suggest uh, listening to us on Stitcher. And, you know, you know, maybe we'll get a little bit of uh, uh, revenue that way through them as well if you listen through them. And, of course, as Greg said, uh, you can find links to all of these uh, applications and where you can find us on the social media uh, pages, which on Twitter and Facebook. All right. I think we got that out of the way. What's next? Well, uh, we are going to um, get into what you want to talk about before we do any of that. We're going to play a game that we like to call Whose Birthday Is It Maestro? <laughs> we baked you a birthday cake. If you get a tummy ache and you moan and groan and woe, don't forget we told you so. Happy birthday! Happy birthday! <laughs> Everybody knows how we play this game by now. I give Al a clue or two or three of an individual whose birthday it is today in the world of sports. And if Al can correctly guess that uh, person within the first two clues, uh, he will receive a snow globe depicting the great blizzard of 1978. Oh, I remember that. Cause I, I, we were out of school like two weeks out here in, the, you know, cause I, out here in Carlton. You know, it was uh, the school district is uh, very, it's even more rural back then than it is now. And I, that was awesome. We didn't have school for almost two weeks. That was glorious. <laughs> and that was, I think, the last really ridiculous blizzard. I re Man, we've had some bad weather since, but I really do right. think that's the last really uh, epic blizzard we've had in southeast Michigan. Yeah, that was uh, that was something else. And I can't believe it's been 40 years. I, I, remember know. It, I, saw, uh, I saw some articles online this week. I was like, oh, my God, it's been that long. 
Well, for the snow globe, uh, this personnel was born on this date in 1949. He is still with us. He's 69 years old today. He made his uh, name in the world of baseball. I will tell you that. Um, I will tell you that he played for the Tigers for a number of seasons. Not just a number of seasons. He played here for four seasons, but made his most most of his hay with another team in the uh, American League East. He did play in a World Series, uh, and he also co-led the American League in home runs uh, with 41 in 1980. Hmm. Uh, is it Ben Ogilvy? Very good, yes. Uh -huh, I'm back on track. <laughs> you are back on track. What gave it away? Uh, I think it was uh, – Oh, I remember that. I think what really gave it away is you said the uh, the winning the home run title in the early in 1980. And okay, that's not long. You know, the the Tigers had kind of given up on Ogilvy. Wasn't I forgot what trade that was a part of, and he just tore it up for the for Harvey's Wallbangers. But that's, yeah, that's for some reason this clicked. You know, the that the, they played a short period of time with the Tigers and then made his name with another team. And when you mentioned the home run title, it all kind of clicked. Yeah, Ben was uh, from Panama. He was born in Panama. He was uh, he became actually the first non-American to lead the American League in home runs, which I did not know that. He tied mm -mm. he tied with Reggie Jackson that year with forty one. Uh, you mentioned the trade. He was traded from Detroit to Milwaukee for Jim Slayton. That's it. Yep. Who then became a free agent and signed right back with yep. Milwaukee. So they ended up with Slayton and Ogilvy, which ticked me off. Mm -hmm. um, and but Benji was uh, he was an outfielder and he also played some first base and uh, he was a popular player in Detroit. Yeah. But um, you know um, the trade was made and uh, he like you said he, he uh, was a huge cog in those uh, really good Brewers teams of the early '80s. Uh, so yeah, so you do get the snow globe depicting uh, the uh, blizzard of '78. Good job. All right, uh, I'll break out the snowmobile and have some fun with it. But uh, there you go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, actually, a couple other housekeeping things before we move on. I guess we should uh, mention that this was probably an audio only podcast at this point, as we're having some sort of bizarre video issue. I, I blame you. I'm not sure why, but uh, I'm just <laughs> join but, the club. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll uh, like said out. Wait we'll line. Get line. Out. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I don't know. Uh, essentially, if we had taken the time to travel and shoot, uh, troubleshoot this, we probably would have uh, not even started a podcast till ten o'clock. So, right. audio only, more than likely. And uh, so, uh, again, I apologize for that. I'm not sure if it's his end or my end. Seriously, that's something we'll have to uh, dig around and, uh, and figure out. But that's what's going on with this. I was also, you know, you can't see me wearing my Eastern Michigan uh, T-shirt this week. You know, in honor oh, of know. Greg. So, yeah. <laughs> But, okay, with that out of the way, uh, let's get down to brass tacks so we can knock out this podcast. Obviously, the, there's been, uh, since we last talked, Greg, two big pieces of news have gone down here in Detroit. And that would be, one, the official hiring of Matt Patricia as the Detroit Lions head coach. And Stan Van Gundy going all in by uh, for the Pistons by trading for, uh, if not a superstar, he's damn near close to one, and, and getting Blake Griffin and his monster contract here to trade deadline. Uh, and we, we'll try and touch on Major League Baseball if we have a chance because uh, we have to talk, decide if it's collusion or free agency that is causing such a cold, hot stove this winter. So with that, let's get to talking Lions. As, as always, the NFL is king. And when it comes to uh, head coaches, that just dominates the news cycle when you're hiring one. In this case, this uh, it was finally made official, Greg, a couple days after the Patriots lost the Super Bowl to Philly, God forbid, and that was Pat's defensive coordinator, Matt Patricia, was named the new head coach. Uh, not a real surprise. This was essentially considered a done deal about three, almost four weeks ago. Uh, he was the last person the Lions hired, I believe the only one that got a second interview. And according to one of Dave Burkett's articles, that second interview was more, more who do you want to be your coaches kind of thing. It was more of like, you're our guy, let's get, figure, let's get this thing moving, even though you're kind of tied up with the paths right now. So, Greg, uh, Matt Patricia, do you think this is the right guy? From all accounts, this really feels like this is who... Bob Quinn has wanted from the beginning, and now it really felt like the opportunity is right. Because I have a feeling this would have happened last year if Jim Caldwell hadn't made the playoffs. Oh, I think that there's no question that um, 
uh, Patricia was uh, targeted uh, from the get-go. I don't think there's any question that uh, no one else really had a chance at that job other than Patricia. Um, I think that um, it was the worst-kept secret. Uh, I know there was some talk early on in the process that he might be uh, being wooed by the Giants and that the Giants might um, – kind of snatch him from underneath the lion's noses but turns out in retrospect uh, from what we know now that was never really the case and uh it was the closeness of quinn and patricia uh all those years they worked together with the patriots that um provided a comfort level that uh bob you know certainly did not have with jim caldwell which was no through no fault of anybody's i mean you mm-hmm. know caldwell was already there and Quinn was the the guy who was hired after him, and you know that's just the way it is. And uh, and you know for, Quinn gave uh, Caldwell two seasons, um, and uh, you know it didn't work out. You know, two nine and seven years, and and what one of the things that Bob had said at, at the press conference when he announced the firing was that you know he he thought that they uh, a couple things really stuck out. One that they didn't beat the good teams, which was true, mm-hmm. and two. That they should have won more games. He, yeah. he felt like you know this is a this is a results oriented oriented business. It's all about wins and losses. And I just thought that we uh, could have won more. And uh, that's the way it is in the NFL. And uh, I don't think it was a case of of uh, he couldn't you know he, he you know, had an itch to hire Matt Patricia. Couldn't wait to do it. I think he gave Jim Caldwell two years, and uh, which is fair. And mm-hmm. uh, it didn't work out. And uh, uh, we went this route. But um, you know, like I said, told you last time. I don't know if there's anybody. That was out there. That was available at the time that the Lions would have hired other than him, other than Patricia, that would have been a better hire. Now you could, of course, you could argue for some of the candidates they did interview: right. Pat Shermer, uh, Mike Vrabel, uh, so forth. But I don't know that you could really have made a better case with Shermer and and uh, Vrabel than you can with you could with Patricia. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This was. Uh... Uh, this is, I think, this has really been brewing since Quinn was hired. Like I said, this is the guy he's always wanted. Much in the way, yeah, hopefully, it won't be. You know how it seemed like Matt Millen, his guy, was always going to be Steve Mariucci. Right. I just hope it doesn't yes. end the same way. <laughs> but yeah, it, it'll work. That was the guy Millen had always wanted. When the opportunity came, he jumped all over him. And actually, because of that, that's why we now have the Rooney Rule. But uh, yeah, this really has been a couple years in the making. Uh, and essentially Quinn was probably looking for, you know, obviously if Caldwell would have won, great. You know, if he would have won a few playoff games, he'd still be here and all be well and good. That didn't happen. And I do like the idea that they think they can do better than mediocre, you know, which is 8-8, eight 9-7. Eight, and seven. So, And I like the idea of a younger, more possibly innovative coach, uh, especially, you know, Patricia being known that he's not stuck on any scheme, which is, I think my favorite thing about him is that he coaches to his – his personnel, which is why you often see the Pats are never, they're not strictly a 4-3 team. They're not strictly a, a 3-4 team. They're not strictly a cover two team, blah, blah, blah. You know, he he goes by what the opposition is doing and the strengths of his of his own personnel. You know, and, and if you look at the guys on that team, you know, this is his defense, Greg, you know, had Kyle Van Noy calling the signals. He, I don't think he had a single All Pro or Pro Bowler on that defense. And even though he didn't have a good Super Bowl, uh, but I think that can be excused somewhat because uh, the Eagles were an absolute juggernaut on offense. I mean, you could argue that Phil that uh, Minnesota had an even better defense than uh, than the Patriots, and they shredded the Minnesota defense. So I'm not going to hold that one game against them. Uh, it was just. I just like the fact that Patricia just seems to be open to, well, he's not stuck on one certain thing, uh, as we've seen with far too many other coaches around here that, the, you know, this is my scheme. I don't care. I'm going to fit these players into square square pegs into round holes if it kills me. And I don't think we're going to see that with Patricia because he's far too smart a man to uh, essentially hamstring himself like that. Well, <laughs> You mentioned I have to laugh when you said um, I, this is my scheme and I'm going to make people fit in no matter what. And first of all, everything you said about Patricia, uh, I agree with because it's been documented by many people that that's the way he rolls. He doesn't yep. uh, he'll go three, four, one week or go four, three the next. Uh, you mentioned Cal Van Noy. I think there's no greater example of how a player can um, be useful in a yep. in a system that works and that uh, is designed to. Uh, make 
players better. And Kyle Van Noy, who was, let's face it, he wasn't, uh, he was a bust when he was here. Yeah. And he was a disappointment. And, um, you know, you could just hear all the Lions fans just shouting at their TVs uh, as, as every week when they heard the, the great things that Van Noy was doing in, in New England. And why couldn't he do those things here? Well, you know, you got to look at the, the, the coaching situation. There is other reason I had to laugh when you said, uh, about the scheming was, and you mentioned Mariucci, and that was the thing that always I always thought was bad about the Mariucci hire was that I don't think Matt Millen did the due diligence that right. he should have. I think if Matt had really looked at it and not gotten so star-crossed and not, mm. not so um, enamored by the name and the, and the glitz and glamour of Mariucci at the time and really would have looked at why uh, Mariucci was successful in San Francisco and whether or not that would transfer to Detroit. If you looked at the personnel, of course, the, Mariucci had the West Coast offense, which at the mm -hmm. time was all the rage. And uh, did he have the personnel to really run it in Detroit? I don't know. Did he have the quarterback to run it in Detroit? Probably not. No, um, hell no, he did not. <laughs> and so you just, you know, I, it was a, it was a, it was a, a big name hire, obviously. Uh, it, you can make no bones about it that Steve Mariucci did have success with the 49ers. But uh, as we saw, uh, he tried to move Mariucci, that is, tried to, uh, and maybe through with Millen's, uh, with Millen being an accomplice, tried to ram that scheme down the throats of the Lions, uh, who were not set up for it per, from a personnel standpoint. Um, and frankly, I, you know, Matt didn't, I think, underestimated how long it was going to take. It, it, by all, but in all fairness, Mariucci probably should have been given at least another year in Detroit. My, in my, it's my opinion. But mm -hmm. regardless, it, you're right. It didn't work out. And you're also right that that that, that was Millen's guy, it seemed like, from the get-go. And he couldn't get him. And then when he finally when the 49ers and Mariucci parted ways, uh, there was that awkwardness when Millen had already told Marty Morningwig that he was going to come back. Mm -hmm. And then did an about-face a few days later when Mariucci became available. And there was that awkward with with Marty, he, he had already told Marty he was going to come back, and then had to go back and and change. And you know that was kind of weird. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think that's what should. That's, I think that's what Lions fans should be most excited about is the fact that Matt Patricia doesn't just isn't doesn't have um, tunnel vision and just it's this is the way it's going to be, and I'm not going to deviate. He uh, he plays to the strengths of his roster, and so it'll be fascinating to see uh, how that uh, shakes out with the Lions uh, based on. Um, their personnel uh, awards uh, and their uh, 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 strengths uh, versus what the Patriots had. Yep, exactly. Uh, one disappointment, I was really disappointed that he trimmed his, uh, here's a reference that's going to age me, his Grizzly Adams beard. You know, <laughs> it, was, it was no longer quite as bushy. He, he obviously had gotten a trimmer out after the Super Bowl. But uh, as, regards, you know, as regards to the press conference, you know, there's not much you can really take from those other than you hope he doesn't come off as essentially Marty Morningwig. <laughs> you remember the bar is high, you know, yeah. BS. Where no, he essentially uh, he did not come off very well in that press conference, and, and in Patricia's case, said all the right things. The only thing that kind of got me was, uh, well, I just said it right there with the uh, um, uh, when he was speaking off the cuff somewhat, uh, you know, which can drive you kind of batty if you start to notice it. But overall, he said all the right things. He made a couple jokes. You know, he put the pencil behind the uh, the ear kind of thing <laughs> yeah. with the, I want to get comfortable now. And uh, it was pretty much a winning press conference and also uh, the fact that it really comes across that he wants to be here. You know, that, uh, you know, because it really looked, uh, no, it was never officially confirmed. But it looked like he had his choice of gigs, and one of them being New York City with the New York Giants, or you know, at least across the river in, in, uh, in New Jersey. And he decided he wanted to go to where he was comfortable, where essentially, uh, as it turns out, it looks like he's pretty damn tight with uh, Bob Quinn, and that's where he wanted to be. He wanted to work with a guy he thinks that with, between the two of them, which is something else I don't think we've, we've seen much in Detroit, uh, where we've seen a, a front office and head coach really in sympathy uh, you know, in uh, uh, in you know, well, they, they they I think they, they're going to feel the same exact way about how they want the team to run and kind of personnel they want. You know, specifically when we saw with uh, Jim Jim Caldwell, he wasn't Quinn's guy. So obviously, I'm sure there were some uh, uh, conversations as to what direction they wanted personnel to go. When it comes to these two, it really looks like they're they're not only in the same page; they're in the same freaking bed. 
And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what a, uh, a combined force these guys can be when it comes to uh, building a team. You know, your best case scenario, you no, know, it, it's uh, like Belichick in, uh, in Boston, but, you know, I, you, obviously I believe these guys are going to be their own man. And, and, that, and that was something else that came across in the, uh, uh, in the uh, press conferences. That, you know, he, he, when asked about Belichick, he said, no, I can't describe him, but I really, you know, I, I loved working for him. And, but he said, I'm, a, I'm my own guy. And that came across when they asked him about, uh, I think uh, Jim Bob Cooter was he going to be his offense coordinator and about scheming and stuff. He goes, I'm the head coach. If I want to make a, if I want to call a play on offense, defense, or special teams, I'm going to call it. And I, and that go okay. I like that attitude. Yeah, and the, th- the other thing I like too is is that he um, really emphasized how he wanted the team to play. He wanted them to be. Uh, uh, structural, uh, or wanted them to be organized. He wanted them to be fundamentally sound. He wanted them to be, uh, to play, play the game the right way, make the city proud. And, um, you know, I guess, you know what I, frankly too, I think what happens Al is that when, whenever somebody comes in and says these things, um, it's different when they're coming from somebody who's had a lot of success versus somebody who might just be saying all the right things for the sake of saying all the right things. A lot of these things that are said aren't any different from what, Marty Morningwig may have said, or what Rod Marinelli may have said, or what, mm-hmm. um, you know. You're going to uh, give me PTSD if you keep those names up, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm know, already it, having flashbacks. And that's fine. It, I mean, that, and that's that's part of it. I mean, it, it, you know, it's hard, I guess, to, you know, in a way, I guess it's kind of hard to have a bad introductory press conference. But yeah. it's there's still something different about when these things are being said by someone who comes from such a – Hugely successful organization. I wrote this in my uh, my column on Wednesday about um, the Patricia hire. Is that I don't recall ever in my lifetime, and you you and I are about the same age. I don't recall there ever being the time where the Lions hired anybody who came from this long of a lineage of winning. I mean, we've had some guys come through here: Bobby Ross, who'd been to Super Bowl, yeah. Don McCaffrey, who'd mm-hmm. been to Super Bowl, uh, Jim Caldwell, who'd been to a Super Bowl, but they didn't come from. You know where they've been, where they had been somewhere for years and years and years, and multiple Super Bowls, multiple victories, multiple championships, multiple. I mean, tons of playoff games. I mean, it, it just they just haven't, and that's mainly because nobody's been as successful as the Patriots have had have been either. Yeah. So, I don't recall that ever happening. So this is yet another new thing. I guess they're going to try, which is bring in a guy who's who's uh, just. That's all he knows is winning. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I also said in, in, in the piece that I wrote, which is not – I'm not the first one to say this, is that that's the easy part. The easy part is to bring the guy over. What's not so easy is to – and that was the point that I was making was that it's it, – it, it, the hard part now is to uh, – he can't just pack – I said that Matt Patricia can't just pack up that – that uh, winning culture in a suitcase like right. he did his clothes and bring it over here. He's got to instill it. And, and there's, there's one thing that he hasn't done yet is, is do that as a head coach. But uh, you know, this is a smart guy and this is, this is somebody who's been, who's worked for maybe the best head coach in football history and for a number of years. And so it's hard to, to think that he couldn't impart some of those things, uh, both good that he liked from Bill Belichick and maybe not do the things that maybe he wouldn't want to do, wouldn't have done if he was Bill Belichick and uh, put his own stamp on the team. Yeah. Yeah. And he definitely came across as uh, a bit more personable than Belichick ever has in front of a podium to say the very least. Uh, Other news this week about the lions, Patricia and Quinn is that essentially at this point, it really appears Quinn and Patricia are tied at the hip uh, it's, if it's either going to be a joint f- a success or a joint failure, as the Lions announced this, or I don't say they announced, but it leaked out this week that the mm-hmm. team had extended GM Bob Quinn's contract, uh, making it the same length as Matt Patricia. I guess now they're, they are both under contract to 2022. And considering, I believe, Stafford still has another four or five years on his extension, essentially now at this point all three of them are tied at the hip. I, mean, I really don't have any issues doing this. I think, for the most part, Quinn has done pretty darn well. I won't say he's been great, but he sure as hell hasn't been bad as GM. He's hit on a lot of mid- and late-round draft picks. Uh, he's made some pretty darn good signings. And as any general manager, you're going to have a few misses here and there when it comes to either draft picks or free agency. But for the most part, he has he seems to have a vision for this team, and he's going about doing it uh 
in a fashion that doesn't feel like it's uh, helter skelter or uh, he's robbing Peter to pay Paul, for example. Like uh, last year, he decided I'm going to fix the offensive line. He went and did that. They had their issues mostly because of injuries, but uh, he has what it really looks like to be. Uh, the start of a very, which could be a very solid offensive line for the next several years. But he didn't touch a few other positions, such as running back. I think that's going to be this year, obviously, in the draft of free agency. He seems to have a plan, Greg, and he's going to implement that plan for better or for worse. So far, I think it has been for better. So I really don't have much of an issue with him getting the extension or the fact that essentially it's him and Patricia are bust at this point. You know, yeah, I mean, this is... <laughs> You know, we've had so many different uh, pairings uh, between uh, front office and coach that have not been successful, and I don't know why you would be uh, opposed to, to giving this a try. Um, yeah. You're right about Quinn. Uh, you know, I've said it before in this program. He doesn't. Uh, he hasn't done anything egregious yet. This is his first coaching hire. This is his first real big thing to do as a GM. I mean, you, as president, you can't. I mean, you, you can talk about drafts. Drafts are great. Free agent signings are great. But it's these the coaching hires that really follow you around. I mean, those yeah. are the ones that really uh, can make or break your um, your uh, legacy as a, as, a, as an executive. And um, so we'll see. But I I I, I think that um, he has Bob Quinn has uh, with his background in player personnel. He's been you know he knows the way around a draft. He's been in those war rooms a, a million times, um, and, and they've drafted so well uh, in, in New England, especially in the mid to lower rounds, mm-hmm. as, as, as all successful NFL teams do, by the way. He's been able to see what that's all about. And, uh, you know, we're, we're coming up into draft number three now for him. And now, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's fair, though, to say that, okay, now you got to start, uh, you know, you, he, and he said it himself when he, when he fired Caldwell, look, these, these nine and seven records are on me. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah. this, is, this is my – this is the team I've been given. The, I've been uh, in charge of, uh, of of the roster. I'm supposed to be improving, and uh, so I, I, you know, I um, I own that. But you know, he, he's you can't fix all the holes in one draft. Obviously, all you can do is is uh, chip away at him. And yeah. and there's no question that the running game, whether it's going to be a, a, a lineman or whether it's going to be a running back or both, is going to be um, I, I would imagine paramount as far as what the team is going to be drafting this spring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's uh, uh, obviously it looks like the, t- the two big things are going to be defensive line and uh, running back. I mean, and those are the two most glaring holes on a team that just missed the playoffs. So, uh, I, I would think re- uh, expectations this year should be to make the playoffs, even with a first year head coach. Uh, even though the, uh, I would not be surprised if, like any first time head coach, uh, Patricia has his. Uh, uh, you know, there's there's periods where he might take a couple steps back before he takes a few steps forward. I mean, it, it just happens with uh, with first time head coaches. But considering the pedigree, I'm not too worried about it. I don't think we're going to see any anything to the effect of the learning curve we saw of Brad Ausmus with the Tigers, for example. I mean, that first year you could argue was a train wreck with some of the decisions he made. Now, I don't expect it to be quite like that with Patricia. Uh, and it really, I and essentially what Quinn has said, Greg, this year after after the moves he's made this off season, and the comments he has made about his team and why he moved on from the the previous regime and coach, uh, he expects this team to win. I really do think he expects this Lions team, especially with some of the improvements he's hoping to make this off season in the draft and free agency, to make the playoffs, probably win double digit games. So uh, I'd like that attitude and that. Uh, he expects to win. He thinks he's going to win, and uh, and I, there's no excuse if there isn't. And, I, and Patricia knows that coming in. Well, you know what? Guess what? No matter what Bob Quinn thinks, no matter what uh, the expectations are inside the halls of Allen Park, by doing this, by firing Jim Caldwell with um, a winning record, or an overall winning record, by um, making this move, period, he has, Quinn has, yeah. uh indeed made this a playoff or bust situation, I think. I, I think that w- w- the thing I liked about the Quinn firing of Caldwell is that it, to me, and I know there are a lot of people who were who didn't like it, who, did, who thought that Jim should be have given an, been given another year, but the thing I like about it is that if the Lions are now to the point where they're going to start moving on from coaches who they feel are have plateaued here, 
Mm-hmm. And even even he even with an overall winning record of thirty six and twenty eight is what which is what it was, and even though he made the playoffs twice, and even though the, the Lions are coming off two consecutive winning seasons, the fact that that wasn't good enough should actually be a, uh, that should encourage Lions fans. I mean, I, I I mean I don't think there's anything wrong. I, I I'm going to get some pushback on this, but I if I don't think there's anything wrong with saying look that's just not good enough. I mean you know this is it's it's. You talk about raising the bar. Well, you know, sometimes I wonder if we haven't been conditioned here with the Lions to accept any modicum of success as greater than what it really is. And in a lot of Thank NFL you. cities, in a lot of NFL cities, nine and seven, two years in a row, two playoff losses in four years, thirty six and twenty eight in four years is not going to get it done. Yep. Uh, a lot of NFL cities that doesn't get it done. And um, hell, you know. Marty Schottenheimer, I think, one year was fired in, in after I think in San Diego after I think he went thirteen and three. Yeah, and was fired in the playoffs. I it mean, you know, it's shot, so. you know, and conversely, Hugh Jackson in in Cleveland is one in thirty one in two years <laughs> in Cleveland, and he's and yeah. he got a contract ex- extension. Exactly. So I mean, it, it it all has to do with what ownership feels like is best for their organization at that particular time. But the fact that the Lions are moving on from coaches with winning records, but, but not winning enough tells me that that bar you talked about when we we mock morning wig, uh, but that bar to me is higher because now that's, that's not going to get it done. Nine and seven used to be heralded around here. Now it's, it's like, no, that's not good enough. Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth because I was going to bring up the fact that there was a significant portion of the Lions fan base who uh, essentially came off as a, they were afraid of the unknown and wanted to keep Caldwell, you know, using the excuses of, well, he has a winning record and he's had the best uh, head coaching record of Lions going back to, uh, to the 50s, uh, winning percentage-wise. And all I can say is that's a pretty goddamn low bar to clear, <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, he still hadn't won a playoff game, as you had said. Uh, and, uh, you know, if in, as I think as any uh, general manager you would hope would do, is that if he doesn't feel like he has the coach in place to take the team to the next level, and in this case the Lions, that's the win some goddamn playoff games, well, then move on from who you have. And so it makes perfect sense, you know. Cause, yeah, I'm with you all, all the way when you said for far too long – uh, probably our almost our entire lifetime as as Lions fans, Greg, is that mediocrity has been heralded as well. It's better than what it could be, you know. So I, I'm all for this. You know, let's let's win some playoff games or bust. You know, let's sink or swim and that kind of thing. It's screw this. Well, let's get the let's get to the playoffs and see what happens. Or you know, as long as we get the nine and seven, we'll keep keep go doing the same old same old and. You know, it reminds me far too much of the team we grew up watching in the '70s. That were they always seemed to finish, Greg, between uh, that was back in the 14 game season. So it was like six and eight, or uh, you know, or you know, seven and seven, right in there <laughs> right. For, for our for that entire decade. <laughs> you know, well, that's, it's it got it, it was no, it was just so frustrating, and yeah. it's refreshing to have. Uh, a front office that says that is not good enough, and right. I, I just hope, I just hope they're the right guys to do it. All right, uh, we got to talk a little bit more about what's going on with the team specifically, uh, contracts, and that is Matthew Stafford. Greg is no longer the highest paid player in the NFL. I don't think that's a shocker. I mean, everybody who knows even a little bit about football and, and quarterback contracts knows it essentially becomes next guy up, whoever the next. Franchise quarterback is who comes up for a new deal. He's going to top the last guy. So in, when Stafford came around, he topped both Flacco and Luck. Now Stafford got his money. Surprisingly, though, Greg, it wasn't Kirk Cousins or Drew Brees who are both uh, going to be free agents. And you know, Cousins' whole thing is a mess right now. His whole uh, situation. But regardless, you would have thought it was going to be maybe one of those two to get that big next huge deal. But shockingly enough. Jimmy Garoppolo, he of the whole seven career starts, earned a five-year, $137.5 million contract with the 49ers. I mean, I got to give the Niners credit for going all in on their quarterback. And Garoppolo has shown signs that the Patriots may have really screwed up big time by essentially giving him a way to keep Tom Brady happy. 
But that's an awful lot of money to give someone with that little experience. You know, the first, know what I, the first thing I thought of, Greg, when I saw that deal? Scott Mitchell. Yeah. Who had ex- almost the exact same situation where he had uh, – Dan Marino got hurt in Miami. Mitchell had a really solid second half of the season covering for him. And the Lions, decided, Lions and Wayne Fonts decided to go all in on Scott Mitchell instead of Warren Moon. Well, we all knew how that happened, but – I think Scott Mitchell is the worst case scenario. Works out if it works out great for uh, the Niners with Garoppolo. Awesome, and they think they have their franchise quarterback, so they locked him up. But damn, that seems like a bit of rolling of the dice with a guy who really hasn't proven much yet. Like I said, defenses don't have a book on this guy yet. I, you know, I I could have seen maybe they franchised him or something, but to go all in for a five year deal with that kind of money, that's kind of scary. Yeah, it is. Uh, that seems to be the trend now, though, is to um, um, overpay to keep uh, to keep guys or to, to basically uh, roll the dice that uh, you're going to be uh, uh, rewarded with that investment down the line. Um, yeah. uh, but, you know, the 49ers uh, have been, ever since Jim Har- Harbaugh left, have been mm-hmm. completely wandering around in the NFL desert, uh, totally – Irrelevant. Um, they're just starving for anybody now to come in there and, and and be their next leader. They haven't had a quarterback in a number of years, and this is uh, they feel like this is their guy. And uh, you know it doesn't hurt probably that he comes from the Patriots. And um, you know here we go again. You know this whole Patriot thing. And um, so, but I you know these are the kinds of investments, Al, that uh, sometimes you just you almost feel like you have to make if you're if you're a team like the 49ers who have been losing for so long and you're just looking for any sort of ray of hope uh and let's face it Garoppolo did play well I mean this isn't I I I see your your the way you're making a parallel with Scott Mitchell uh and for those who may not know Mitchell of course came in and replaced Dan Marino in 1993 uh did Played okay, played well for the yeah, Dolphins. Yeah, I think he put uh, up a, a quarterback rating there in the high 80s, but it was also a different era as well when it comes to passers. Right, it was a different yeah. era, and and and, 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 I, and the fact that the the Dolphins didn't completely go in the tank after Marino went down, I think, was a a, a big surprise, and I think Mitchell. Um, clearly parlayed that into big money, not once but twice with the Lions, and. You know, that's a good example. But, you know, Mitchell had his time. He had a couple of good years in Detroit as well. I mean, you know, it wasn't he wasn't a complete bust. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know what you're saying. But, but Mitchell wasn't the highest, play, pay, highest paid player in the NFL either, like uh, Garoppolo. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but he, he, that's what happens, Al, when, when, especially at the, at the quarterback position, which is still, after all these years, still the most important position, maybe in all of sports, certainly in all of football. And when you feel like you've got somebody – that could be your franchise guy. Um, you know, you you tend to want to err on the side of inclusion instead of uh, not, and and, and you, so you lock them up. Yeah, I just do. I just want to throw one thing out there though. Uh, Colin Kaepernick in his last year of a starter with uh, San Francisco in 2016, he had uh, 16 touchdown passes, four interceptions, a quarterback rating of 90.7. Yeah, but unfortunately, also San Francisco went one and ten in those starts. Mm-hmm. Jimmy Garoppolo in his uh, five starts with uh, San Francisco, uh, a rating of uh, ninety six point two, seven touchdowns, five picks. Yeah. Not a big difference, is there? Right, right. Yet Colin Kaepernick has been blackballed, blackballed out of football. And Jimmy right. Garoppolo is now the richest man in the game. See, yep. sometimes football does not make any sense at all. Right. You know, essentially, uh, San Francisco could have been getting similar production. You know, and Kaepernick has his issues. I don't think he's going to. I don't think he has the ups. He had the upside of uh, Garoppolo, but he's not a bad quarterback, and he should be in the league. And he's probably a better starter than uh, probably at least. Uh, 40% of the guys who are starting for NFL teams right now. But it just kind of, that kind of drove, kind of, I looked this up and I'll go, okay, Garoppolo, you know, he's going to get, you know, close to $30 million a year. And yet, Colin Kaepernick was making a fraction of that and put up very similar stats. So, again, your mileage may vary. I just think this is a very risky uh, deal 
for well, of uh, course it is seven, well, of course. seven starts Greg seven freaking course. starts well, you know that what you me. know what of course it's a risk but you, but at the same time you know you, sometimes you know this is don't forget this is uh, the 49ers now being run uh, this is another parallel by the way to yeah you could, I know where you're going with this the, yes. the, the Lions are being are, are the Lions the 49ers are being run by uh, uh, Lynch John Lynch yep. the former uh, Tampa Bay um, safety and TV was hired analyst. What's that? And he was a TV analyst. Right. He was a TV analyst hired right out of the broadcast booth, just like Matt Millen was, to become the general manager of the, of the 49ers. But – so that's got to make you – you know, that's got to give you pause. But on the other hand, sometimes though, you you know, we've seen this with, with guys like – look, we just saw in the Super Bowl, Nick Foles. We saw in the playoffs with some other guys, mm-hmm. uh, Bortles, uh, Blake Bortles. Sometimes you you – even – I know it's just seven starts, but sometimes that's all you need – to think that you've got something. I mean, I, I know that that's, it may sound crazy because it is seven, only seven starts, but sometimes a kid shows you enough at that position because, again, this is the most important position on the field. Sometimes a guy shows you enough in those seven games to make you think that you, so you extrapolate it out and say, okay, boy, if he, you know, he's just going to get nothing but better. I mean, that, that's, mm-hmm. that's the game plan. I mean, the game plan isn't that, okay, those are the, the, the best seven games this kid's ever going to play. The game plan is he's going to just continue to get better with the right coach, you know, which, which is also key, and the right, uh, now, you know, the right people around him, obviously. But we feel like that this, is the, this is the guy. We've seen him enough. I know it's only seven starts, but that's, hey, that's almost half mm-hmm. a season, you know? You know, you can, you can play, hey, Al, you can play yourself out of a job in seven games just as much as you can play yourself in one. And, they feel like that he's the guy, and and yeah. you know until they're proven wrong. I mean, is it a risk? Of course, it's a risk. Of course, it is. But I mean, this is this is professional sports. This isn't you know high school stuff. This is this is a you you have to take risks sometimes in order to be to find yourself at the top of the heap, and um, it's a big gamble, of course. But uh, uh, that franchise, frankly, you mentioned uh, Kaepernick. Yeah, maybe this is another way for them to try to put the whole Kaepernick thing behind them. Yeah. And and just I know it, it and all that does is put of course extra pressure on Garoppolo. Mm-hmm. But you know, by doing this, uh maybe they're also trying to say, look, this is the Jimmy Garoppolo era now. You know, we don't want to hear about Colin Kaepernick. I mean, these are, they, they don't want to hear about the Ka- Kaepernick anymore. There'll be a lot yeah. of people that, that will remind them, of course. But mm-hmm. this is just another way for them to move on from the whole Kaepernick, the stench of the Kaepernick thing. And I, when I say stench, I'm not blaming him, Kaepernick. Yeah. I'm just saying the stench of, of, of what happened. Yeah, of how it was handled. It was not right. handled well at all. Right. right. All right. Oh, okay. Um, speaking of stench, Greg, this is, I think this is a topic that's been building up with both of us for a while now. And the recent uh, coaching surge of the Lions, I think, kind of pushed it over the top. We got to talk about the, uh, the Carlos Monterez situation at the Detroit Free Press. Oh, gosh. Who has become... Well, you know, we used to rail somewhat at, at, um, at Drew Sharp, you know, the late Drew Sharp before he passed right. away. He was the free press's lead columnist, and he very often took a contrarian view of things. Right. Uh, but to his credit, he was right. Okay, he was right once in a while, and you got the feeling that he you, he really believed what he was writing. That's, that's just who Sharp was. So the free press, in their infinite wisdom, has decided uh, apparently to groom Monterez into the <laughs> contrarian columnist position, uh, taking over for Sharp, more or less. And uh, I just went through a, a running tally of some of the most ridiculous columns we've seen over the past month, Greg, and it is some stupid, stupid, stupid stuff. Uh, first one, uh, here's, here's a, I'm just going to go through a list, and we'll chime in on all this. Uh, Matthew Stafford's lobbying could compromise the Detroit Lions coaching search, you know, because <laughs> of the, you know, because essentially all he says is, I would like... Jim Bob Cooter to stay as offensive quarter. That was Matthew Stafford's lobbying, wasn't it? That's all he said. Uh, and apparently uh, it didn't compromise anything because the I Lions ultimately hired probably the top coaching candidate available in uh, Matt Patricia. Uh, and here's another one. Detroit Lions coaching search still feels like musical shares on the Titanic. Uh, keep in mind, Greg, that uh, most pundits had the Lions listed as the top job available and this was before it became known that the Giants also had Patricia in their crosshairs as their top candidate. Uh, another headline. Can Detroit Lions GM Bob Quinn fire coach Matt Patricia if he struggles? You brought this one up because I mis- <laughs> forgot this one. 
<laughs> of course, this was written, as you said, one day after the guy was hired, which is absolutely asinine. Um, here's another one. Matt Patricia should be his own man. Fire Lions <laughs> offensive coordinator Jim Bob Cooter. Okay, so, you know, so this is the thinking. Instead, Patricia, who was primarily a defensive coach in his entire career, he decides to keep most of the staff on a top 10 scoring offense and an offensive coordinator who's been rightly thoroughly credited with taking an off criticized, uh, scatter armed quarterback and taking him to the next level, where essentially at this point, Stafford is arguably a top five quarterback in the NFL now. Um, next headline Detroit Lions might be hiring the wrong Patriots coordinator. This one took the cake, Rick. This was written a couple of days before Josh McDaniels, who was the uh, offensive coordinator for the Patriots, and was from all accounts going to become the Colts' new uh, head coach. This was a, two day, a couple of days later after he wrote this crap. McDaniels torpedoed the Colts by reneging on an agreement to coach the team, going back and taking a raise to the Patriots, probably because he said, You'll be the next head coach after Belichick leaves. And this is after several assistants had been hired, absolutely leaving the Colts in the lurch. Yet, you know, Monterey's thought, this is the guy they should have. I think it also played into because Patricia did not have a good Super Bowl, even though he's won several as defensive coordinator. You know, you know this is the old uh, small sample size bullshit that a lot of columnists I can't stand do. Like uh, Rob Parker was another one I hated who did that. He used small sample sizes. Here's another one. Can't, this is the latest column from this genius. Can the Detroit Lions follow the Eagles' blueprint and win a Super Bowl? Okay, this is one entire column, and it's a backhanded slap at Matt Stafford's contract because uh, he goes into it saying, "Old oh, Nick Foles won the game, you know, who was a backup quarterback, third-round pick, blah, blah, blah. And also, you know, also mentioned the fact about uh, some of the other quarterbacks who made noise in the playoffs, like Case Cam. This is conveniently forgetting, Greg, that the Eagles have Carson Wentz as their starting quarterback, and he's going to be their starting quarterback once he recovers from his knee injury. Right. He was playing at an MVP level, and the Eagles are going to lock this guy up long-term before he hits free agency in 2020, and he is going to get paid at a Stafford, uh, Garoppolo, Breeze, Luck level. It's a, uh, No, this kind of crap, Greg, is why – journalism as a whole is dying and no one trusts what comes out of, for the most part, especially columnists, uh, hands, you know, cause you, you see a guy at the free press like Dave Burkett. No, he is probably the best beat writer in town. Gets a lot of breaking stories. He's probably the, one of the most in-depth guys. In fact, all of the beat writers in town, uh, Meineke at M live, uh, Rogers at the news. And of course, Burkett, they're all goddamn good reporters and they do a lot of good work. Yet they still have guys on staff like Monarez who was just throwing out absolute tripe. If you know even a little bit about the game of football, all you can do with these things is roll your goddamn eyes. Is you can't believe what he's writing. Oh, and what what, what I forgot? No, what headline I forgot, Greg? Why the Detroit Lions must trade Matthew Stafford for Tom Brady? Yeah, I know this. That premise was so goddamn stupid it made my goddamn head hurt. And you didn't Why is mention this guy even writing this track. And you did not mention the one where he said that the hiring of Matt Patricia was not original enough. Yes, that was oh, the other yes, one. Yes, that's another it was one. Not, it was not. was not original enough. Uh, that Bob Quinn uh, did not show any originality in hiring Matt Patricia. Uh, yeah, I. You know, uh, everything you've said. I. I uh, Moneris is, is, is a is a is a tool. I mean, you mentioned trolling. Uh, if you look at the if you look at the the comment sections, which I you know I don't. You, you can't put a lot of always put a lot of stock into that either. But you look at the <laughs> comments section uh, underneath, nice. yeah, underneath his all of his columns, and he just gets ripped to shreds. I mean, yeah. uh, and, but 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 there's you know what though, Al? There's a dip, there's a different way to be ripped to shreds. You can yeah. be a a really good controversial uh, writer um, who is respected, but you can still be ripped to shreds for different reasons he Moneros gets ripped to shreds for the the trolling aspect and the and the and the ridiculous um notions of his of his concepts and you may you and you just yeah. through you just went through a whole a lineage of them uh you know should trade brady for staff uh, for stafford for brady and and everything all the other ones that you mentioned were just mm-hmm. 
you know, people in the columns comment section, people are saying, you know, even before I clicked on this article, I knew yep. that it was written, who it was written by without even knowing who, mm-hmm. who the author was. I knew who it was just by looking at the headline. And granted, we know that columnists don't write their own headlines, but the, the, the headlines were still still captured. They, they were accurate. They were accurate and they captured the flavor of what, of what the column was about. And, uh, yeah. I, you know. Uh, there's you mentioned sharp you know we had our issues with him for sure yeah. you and i did but but you know Lee drew did not do that he was he had some some semblance of of having a clue yes i i, I this stuff from Moneris al is some of it is almost like and, and this is and this is coming from a blog you know we're you and i are both bloggers this is coming yes. from a blogger a fellow blogger i it it's bad it's like from a bad blog it's from it's like from a bad <laughs> amateur yes blog it's you know the bra- trading on uh, on blogger back in night in like 2004 trading <laughs> right trading stafford for brady i i my jaw dropped on that one mm-hmm. um not being original enough when he hired patricia and and, and, and you mentioned the mcdaniels thing and oh that on was and on and on especially the time um, you know <laughs> I, I i just i don't know what i don't you know i think he also took them to task because he he had asked um Patricia, if the team could win a Super Bowl, and he didn't like the fact that Patricia hemmed and hawed on it, and yeah, you know, I he uh, I don't know what to say other than yeah. they, they feel like they need when I say they the free press feels like they need somebody to take on this like you mentioned this sharp the the, the mantle of the Drew Sharp mantle, and it's it's being done in a, in a poor. All, it's all and I don't know. It, it's not making them look. At, here's the ironic thing: it's if it if it was designed to stir up. It's one thing to stir up controversy, but it's another thing to make yourself look stupid, which is what the newspaper is doing by keeping him on their payroll. Yeah, it's 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 not helping them. This isn't this isn't a case of somebody. That, like again, you can be a lightning rod and be respected. There, are, I can go through. A, there are a whole bunch of of really good writers in this business that are are good and are respected but are still lightning rods but you know what at the end of the day even the people that are are taking these guys to task will tell you in 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 private yeah i he knows he knows his stuff i just don't agree with him i don't like i don't like his takes but i will admit that the dude does know a lot about what he's talking about i just happen to disagree there's there's that way of being a lightning rod and there's this other way of being a lightning rod which just makes everyone look at the free press and the free press sports department look so um silly and i you know i i don't know you know i I don't know what what the thinking is about that and maybe in this day and age al of of so much information being available on the internet that maybe it doesn't even matter anymore maybe maybe newspapers don't even care anymore frankly that they've that they, that this stuff is out. i mean maybe it's maybe it just isn't even a make maybe it's not make a break maybe yeah. to them it's that what, what do we care what do we care yeah but i, I all, all i know is that it it, it just does when you it just equates the free press with a an amateurish sports department and and uh it's 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 pretty it's really nauseating yeah, this is a, a paper that used to employ guys like Joe Falls, right. like Downey, right? Uh, Mitch Albin before he got all sappy and idiotic. I mean, yeah. But but Mitch Albin in the eighties was a really good writer, even yeah. into the nineties, right? And now to see this trite being churned out by the free press, Joe Falls got to be spinning in his grave. Oh. you know, oh, you know this, this town has this town has a a fine lineage of some really really good columnists. And right now, this town has a, a absolute. There's there, a Darth of them. There's no one there. Right. Now, other than maybe Bob Ojanowski, and even he grates on me the wrong way sometimes because right. he's he's too cute to a fault at times. Right, right. I think right. his radio persona bleeds over into his newspaper persona, right. and that what bothers me because right. he's not that dumb, and it comes across, and that comes across um, right. in, in the paper sometimes. Right. But, uh, you know, uh, when Wojanowski is the best guy in town, uh, again, that's a low damn bar to clear. And Monterez is going way under that bar, to say the very least. So, But, yeah, you're right. The fact that this guy is getting a paycheck and the freak seems to be happy with him because he keeps churning out this crap, it says a lot of things about the current state of journalism and sports coverage in today's world, and it's, none of it is good. None of it. Yep. All right. I'm out of breath after that rant, but <laughs> 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 the show's not over yet. All right. 
Uh, all right, let's change topics since I blew the uh, birthday game out of the water, so no question two. And let's go on to uh, Stan Van Gundy because, you know, last time we talked, right, we were saying, you know, the Pistons are – they got some decisions to make. What are they going to do? Specifically, they need to trade Avery Bradley, you know. And I think we, oh, us, along with pretty much everybody else, thought, well, if all things go well by the trade deadline, they, they'll maybe get a, fir- a low first-round draft pick for Bradley because Bradley could be a good fit, you know, on a contending team that needs a defensive stopper type. But, you know, a guy who is not going to be your first or second option, he's a third, fourth option kind of guy. Well, I got to say, when I heard this went down, and this is like all SVG trades, all Van Gundy trades, there's not a whisper of it. Because this might do, but there was not a whisper of he's going all in on. Right. Contract, and it wasn't working out in Detroit. Tobias Harris, who, good player, not a great player. Again, he is not, she, she should not be the focal point of your offense. And Boban Moranovic, who, you know, is much fun as having have him on the team, he really just isn't fast enough to play, a, to play in today's smaller, faster NBA. And, of course, there was also a first-round draft pick in 2018, which is lottery-protected, only the first four picks. So that's essentially nothing that's, that's going to go. And a second-round pick. Why I put third, I don't know, when there's no, <laughs> there's no third round in the NBA. <laughs> uh, but, but for this to get a 28-year-old Blake Griffin and his monster five-year, $171 million contract. I mean, this was a, a true max deal, you know, because at the time the Clippers had his bird rights so they could go over the cap with this. And this is uh, – and what's, what was really, I think, jaw-dropping about this was not just Pistons got, uh, got themselves a superstar, is the fact that this past offseason there was a huge to-do, Greg, about how the Clippers wanted to make Griffin a clip for life. I mean, they had this uh, huge fake ceremony about how they're going to retire his jersey, you know, at the uh, – you know, and they put him up in the rafters. He was going to become – he was going to be their – no, they're they're Larry Bird, they're uh, Magic Johnson. You know, you know what I'm saying. You know, the type of guy who's going to essentially be uh, one team for life, and is it's going to be in the Raptors, and we're going to pay you as much. So he's under contract. He's like 31, 32 years old, and then of course six months later they deal him, along with a couple of add-ons, Bryce Johnson and Willie Reed, who are a backup center and a G League guy, and so all of a sudden the Pistons have. Blake Griffin, a man who makes movies, makes commercials, and has ambitions beyond just being a basketball player. I mean, he's in a movie that's coming out shortly. So, with this move, Greg, you know, they, they, uh, and Van Gundy has apparently always wanted his superstar because it's become more and more apparent that Andre Drummond needs a Batman because he is a Robin. He is not a Batman. You know, he is not the leader. He is a supporting player. He's Pippen. He's not Michael Jordan, essentially. So he needed someone to play off of. So he got that guy in Blake Griffin, who who was used to playing with a very athletic center, which you know, which he had out in in, um, in LA. But this also means, Greg, that the Pistons are effectively capped out. They really don't have a lot of maneuvering room to make future moves, which really means that Ben Gundy now has to hit gold in the lottery because they are not going to be able to fix any more. I wouldn't say lottery. I should say in the draft, pardon me, because they should hopefully make the playoffs this year. But this means that Van Gundy really has to find some good supporting players, like more Luke Kennards and Stanley Johnsons in the draft 
because when you've got this much money essentially tied up, and, and now three players, if you throw Reggie Jackson in the mix, and he's untradeable right now, that with your team is those three plus whatever sorority and cash you can build around them, but they have next to no money left to be able to build a supporting cast other than keep the guys they already have, specifically Kennard, Bullock, Johnson, maybe a couple others, and you know didn't get lucky in the draft because apparently in today's NBA, the way to win is that you need a superstar. I mean, as we've seen, the two, 2004 Pist- Pistons were not to be emulated; they were the exception to the rule. And you need a super. You need more than one superstar, and hopefully Drummond can live up to playing with Griffin. But this also means now the pressure's on Stan Van Gundy that he now needs to hit in the draft because even with Griffin, this is not a team that's going to win a title. I mean, this is a team that I think Max is out right now is maybe winning in the first round. That's it. If they even get that far, they're, they're out of the playoffs right now since the trade they're five and two since they lost today. So thoughts on Blake Griffin? I like the deal. I like the guy. I like the fact that he's taking a risk and he's not going to blow this entire thing up. But it was also pretty blatantly obvious this is a deal that's going to try and save my job because Tom Gores told me this is playoffs or bust. So you know, so Van Gundy wants to save his job, so he found himself a superstar. Well, I hate to burst a lot of people's bubble, but um, Blake Griffin hasn't made the made the All Star team in I think three or four years in a row now. Now, granted, yeah, some of that has to do with his health. Some of it has to do with the player. Some of it has to do with injury. Down, you know, that could be a big issue. Some of it has to do with injury, but that's a, but that's a consideration. Yeah. Okay. Secondly, um, he and because, so since he hasn't been in the All Star game, he, he's you can't call him a top fifteen, top ten player anymore. Mm-hmm. He's um, you know he's still young enough to still be a good a good player. He's no longer a great player, um, but on the other hand. Uh, is he better than? Is he, is he better, better than, than any of the guys he, they traded? Is he better than Tobias Harris? He's a different yes. player than Tobias Harris. But he's a better that, player. I, I will agree. I will he agree can do that. more than Tobias Harris. Yes, he can um, when he's healthy and when he's when he's right. I do like the fact that he his attitude coming here was a lot better than I thought it might be. Yeah, that's a that's uh, a good point. I was wondering because this is a guy who has L.A. written all over him. Right, um, but. Uh, you know, when you're making that kind of money and you and you're guaranteed that kind of money, and and the, yeah. the new the, the new team is 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 uh, picking up that tab, uh, I guess it doesn't really matter. Right. Uh, you can always go to L.A. during the off season, as far as that goes, as far as that goes. But mm-hmm. um, you know the and you're right about you can't get it. Getting superstars in the NBA is not an easy task. There's no question about that. And you're also right that Detroit is not a free agent destination. So forget that notion. Um, but this, it's an, uh, you know, from a cap standpoint, from a roster um, flexibility standpoint, I don't know how this trade helps anything. I mean, it doesn't this help is, much at all. They are really. Uh, yeah, and you they're mentioned still. about having to hit the jackpot on the lottery, lottery, which the Pistons have never done right. ever, really, in the whole history of the franchise. So since the, at least since the lottery has been in effect in, in the mid '80s. So you know, I mean, I. I I, I don't know what – this was certainly not expected. Uh, I, when I, when my friend um, who, who follows the NBA very, very closely texted me the next day and said, did you hear about the big blockbuster Pistons trade? And I thought he was being facetious. Mm-hmm. And I said, no. And, and uh, he told me. I said, whoa. And, uh, uh, but, you know, I mean, it's <sighs> – are they better in the in the very, very short term? Yes, probably. Uh, are they – so much better that they are now going to be in the in the talk uh, of of being a Eastern Conference player in the playoffs. No, uh, they're still they still don't play good enough defense. They still don't have uh, now. You know, you could say, well, when Reggie Jackson gets back, maybe that'll change a little bit. But they, you know, they still don't. They still run, go through periods of time where they don't move the ball. They don't have a lot oh, of yeah. player yeah. movement. I want, and, like the, for example, that game uh, against the Clippers Friday. In the fourth quarter, that offense came to a complete stop where they had four guys looking at Blake Griffin saying, do something. Yeah. You know? And, so if, and frankly, Griffin scored or the Clips got the rebound. Frankly, uh, Griffin, uh, fr- Griffin is only shooting 41% since he, since he came over. Uh, he is helping, though. He's a good passer. He's, he's, I think he's probably helping Andre 
Uh, just like you would bring in another defensive lineman in a line so you yeah. can't double team the other guy. I mean, he's helping in that regard. Um, but uh, they still don't play. They still don't play good enough defense. They still take too many. They still have too many long gaps where they just I, they they want they, they wander off mentally. I I don't know. And to me, that's all on that's all on Coach Van Gundy. We could talk all you want about Executive Van Gundy, and we have. But I mean, Coach Van Gundy. Frankly, is is uh, just as much to blame for this as anything. I mean, I, I, it seems like the Pistons are have the same. Whenever the Pistons lose a game, Van Gundy has the same complaints over and over and over again. And at what point uh, does that become more of the coach's uh, onus than it does the players? But uh, everybody's joined at the hip right now. And, and frankly, what this what this trade does too, Al, as far as I'm concerned. Is uh, like it or not, it, 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 I see it as, as if it buys Van Gundy another couple of years at least in Detroit. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Because I, I think that uh, now with Gore's, uh, uh, he's probably thinking, okay, I'll give the, this Blake Griffin thing a try, and, and, and I'm not going to give it a try with a different coach. I'm going to keep Stan around, and so the, the, this move probably bought Stan another couple of years. And uh, but eventually, if they don't make the playoffs, they don't do anything. Um, he's going to go eventually. But right now, I, I think Pistons fans who were thinking that Stan Van Gundy was on the hot seat, I, I think this trade takes him kind of unbelievably off the hot seat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, because I, I, I kind of get the impression that Tom Gores uh, wanted a star. He loves his you – know, he's an L.A. guy too, you know, and he wants, he wants that kind of a player on his team. And yeah, you're right about uh, Griffin is that he's not the player he was a few years ago. Both, a lot of it has to do with injuries because he was so dependent on uh, his athleticism. He's, like I said, he's no longer jumping over Kias anymore, for example. But like he did in the, uh, what, the dunk contest that one year. But, you know, it's I like the idea that Ben Gundy you know, said, screw it, I'm swinging for the fences. You know, because what it would – the mix I have right now just wasn't going to cut it. You know, if they made, you know, they weren't going to make any kind of noise in the playoffs at all. And the fact that Bradley was just an experiment, it didn't work. And, you know, so I put it this way. There, I, I was always mitigating circumstances, Greg, but don't we always say the team that gets the best player wins the trade? Well, in this oh. case, the Pistons did get the best player. The problem is, is that player good enough? And the question, you know, that remains to be seen. But if you go by uh, the last couple of years, probably not. But he is still a better player than Avery Bradley, who was going to be a free agent anyway. He's a better player than Tobias Harris, who, nice player, decent contract, but he's not a star. He's, you know, he's a complimentary piece. And Boban is what Boban is. And, you know, he's a bench guy. And the first round pick where the line where the top line there we go again where the Pistons were going to pick, it was not going to be a guy who was as good as Blake Griffin. So I, I can at least understand the thought process in getting Griffin. The fact is, you know, is Griffin good enough to put this team on his shoulders and win a couple playoff series? Probably not. That's the thing. Well, I think that the uh, the the Clippers, I think all along. They, they, what they didn't want to do, of course, was let Blake Griffin go for nothing. I mean, they, they, that was that was the dilemma that they faced. So they did they overpay uh, for him? Yes. And did they? And you mentioned this whole rigmarole about pretending like they were going to retire his jersey and everything. Yeah. I think that what they what they wanted to do is get him, you know, signed, and then they wanted to flip him eventually. And they just all they needed to do was find a team. Whether I don't know if they thought it was necessarily going to be this year, but find a team that they could they could do that with, and they found one. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, my 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 friend who I was uh, who I was talking to you uh, telling about telling you about who was a big NBA guy said, "Boy, this reminds me a lot of the whole Bob McAdoo Dick Vitale thing." I said, "Oh gosh, please!" You mentioned the PTSD thing mm-hmm. uh, when I mentioned uh, some of those Lions coaches of the past. Um, I do not want to hear anything about Bob McAdoo and Dick Vitale. I I, I don't think it's that bad, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, this is certainly a matter of uh, the coach Van Gundy playing 
playing the Vital role, and he he got enamored with Blake Griffin. And Blake Griffin is a good player. He's but he's not the player he was three or four years ago. He just isn't. Now part of that is, of course, the injuries. But uh, he can't jump anymore. He's not he's not as explosive as he used to be. Um, is he again? Is he better than Tobias Harris? Probably, uh, but no. I think is merely being better than Tobias. He's a better player than Tobias Harris. Come on, is is merely being better than Tobias Harris? Does that does that mean that the Pistons are an appreciably better team, or does that mean they're just a little bit of a better team? That's the question. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I would say even still, uh, if you know, looking at the stats, you know, even if Griffin isn't the guy he was three, four years ago, he's still an appreciably better player than uh, the guy he replaced in Tobias Harris. I mean, for the playmaking and rebounding alone, Tobias Harris was not a good defender. He didn't rebound. And when he got the ball, he was a black hole. He did not pass the ball. I think those are the differences. I mean, I yeah. he, I think he's an appreciably better player than Tobias Harris. But the problem is, is that there's no other – at this point, with the money involved between the three the, – the big three, if you want to call them that, Drummond, uh, Griffin, and Jackson, there's absolutely no if – they, if they want to stay under the luxury tax, which apparently all the teams do – there's no appreciable room to make any other significant improvements. You know, because uh, SGG did make a couple other deals at the trade deadline, but they're uh, for bench guys. He picked up, right. uh, he flipped uh, Reed for uh, for a veteran point guard, Jameer Nelson. You know, that's like a, that's a stopgap. Essentially waiting for, uh, because right now the backups behind Ish Smith are essentially G League guys and a guy playing out of position in Langston Galloway. Right. And then he also sent Johnson for a three and D guy and James Ennis, which that's a deal I'd like. That's the kind of player that SVG has to hit on now. You know, right. a, a guy who's on a reasonable deal, who outplays the contract. That's how the if the Pistons are going to win now, Greg, it has to be on guys who outplay their contracts. Because so Griffin's not going to do that. We're both in agreement right. there. Right. But they need Kennard to outplay his contract. They need Stanley Johnson to outplay his contract. Yeah. They need Ennis to outplay his contract. They need guys like that to outplay their contracts, to be able to do anything other than make the playoffs and hope to make noise. Because right now, like I said, they're just hoping to make noise in the playoffs with this team. Because, you know, as you had mentioned, though, they still have their offensive struggles because it's going to take time to figure out how Griffin fits best and what Van Gundy wants to do with this offense. Because if I see another long two from this team, I'm going to throw my remote at the television, which is one of the reasons why I hated Bradley on this team. Because he would never take a couple steps back and take a three. He would take a, a 20 foot two rather than a 23 <laughs> foot three. That just, that's the kind of crap that drives me bonkers. But that's also the kind of stuff that SVG has to coach these guys out of. So, and you can't, Al, you can't, and you can't be taken seriously when you're losing to the Atlanta Hawks. Yeah. Yeah. This that is was a bad loss. It's, it's, it's one thing to lose to the Atlanta Hawks in November and December when, when, you know, even the Hawks might think like they can have somewhat of a decent season, yeah. they, but they've checked out. The Hawks have checked. They're eighteen and thirty nine. Yeah, they're, they'll win twenty four, twenty five games this year, and and I know they were playing at home. I understand that. But if you're a team that really feels like you're you're trying to make a move for the playoffs and you're going to try to get yourself in a position where you can, uh, you know, at least make the playoffs and and there's supposed to be all this urgency and and everything, you can't play the kind of defense the Pistons did in Atlanta. Like they did today, and and uh, call yourselves um, playoff worthy. Uh, these are the teams you have to squish, yep. like bugs. I, I don't care. I don't care uh, if you're on the road or not, and I don't care if Blake Griffin's new or not, and I don't care if if you feel like you're a little tired. I don't feel like I don't care about any of that. If, if you, this, these are the teams that are, are these 24, 25 win teams, and I know they got to get the 24, 25 wins against somebody. I understand that. But that means that 80% of the time or 70% of the time they're losing. Yeah. And you, if, if you're playing a team that loses seven out of every 10 games, you got to beat them. I'm mm-hmm. period. I, 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 I know that and on any given night, any team can beat the other. I understand that. But the, the this time of year when teams are, the, the, the Hawks are playing out the string and you and you supposedly have something to play for, and if you're not, if that's the best you can do, um, then you, you you don't you can't be in the you you can't honestly call yourselves in, in, in worthy of playoff caliber discussions. You just you just can't do it. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, it's good. It's, it's going to be interesting to see how the how the season plays out, especially if they're talking. Jackson could be back in like two or three weeks. 
But then again, you know, you can't expect him to hit the ground running either. He's, you know, he's got a rehab. It's going to, that's, and that's going to be another, he's going to have to get in playing shape. And then that's going to be another guy who hasn't played in be a few months that you have to factor into the offense, you know? So, uh, Van Gundy could spend the rest of the season trying to get his offense figured out, but he better do it soon because, as you said, they're, they're out of the playoffs right now if they started today. I think they're a couple of games behind uh, the the 76ers and the process as, uh, as we speak right now. So uh, I'm sure we'll touch this – we'll continue to touch on this topic as the season goes on. But at the very least, now with uh, Blake Griffin, gives us more to talk about, so I'm happy about that. All right, Greg, one more topic before we call the night and – that we can di- di- I can dive in to figure out why, why the hell we don't have video, but still. <laughs> All right, we got to talk what's going on in the hot stove, the hot stove league, and that well, it's non existent for the most part this year, Greg. Uh, in Major League Baseball, only a handful of big name free agents have signed, you know, the expected big money contracts. Uh, like uh, a big one finally dropped yesterday when Wu Darvish signed with the, the Cubbies for, I believe, six, 120, six years, $126 million. But if you look what's going on, only four of ESPN's top 11 free agents have signed uh, what you would call the expected deals, the type of money you would expect uh, a, a veteran good player to get in free agency. And Lorenzo Cain got 580 from the Brewers. Uh, as I mentioned, Darvis got his deal. Carlos Santana uh, left uh, Cleveland, went to the Phils for 360 Zach Cozart went to the Angels for 338. And that's pretty much been it. Uh, there's been some bargain deals. Uh, Todd Frazier, who I think was expected to get more, ultimately settled with the Mets for two years, $17 million. But almost all the free agents that are out there right now that you would consider mm-hmm. name players, guys you would expect to be starters on playoff teams or at the very least you know, expect to be big-time contributors, uh, who are all, for example, you know, all, they're all in their late 20s, early 30s. You know, we're talking guys like Jake Arrieta, J.D. Martinez, who had a monster year last year, Alex Cobb, Eric Cosmer, Mike Moustakis. All the guys, you know, five, ten years ago would have gotten, they would have been given $20 million a year contracts. They would have handed out like candy. Well, all these guys are set to go to a spring training set up by the MLBPA because they have no place else to go. As of this point, because spring training starts what, like a, a week or two, yeah. and none of these guys have I have a team yet. So now the talk returns to: Is it collusion? Where, as we saw what happened in the late eighties, specifically with guys like Jack Morris and Kirk Gibson, where the owners are saying, "I'm just not going to spend that kind of money. I'm going to force them to go back to their team, or we're going to force them to settle for cheap contracts." And that got proved in court that big league baseball did collude against those players and they had to give them money. They settled with guys and Morris and Gibson, they all got significant amounts of money from that. So is it collusion why these guys aren't getting signed or is it a new style of uh, front office front offices and that analytics are coming to the fore in that teams are no longer willing to pay heavily for past performance. They are definitely afraid of burdensome contracts at this point because of the uh, again, there's uh, there's that soft cap, that luxury tax that the that the Tigers went over the last couple of years, and there and the fact that rather than become this this middle class of teams that are that hover around 500 and hope to sneak into a wild card, well, more and more teams seem to be tanking like the Tigers rather than hovering around that 500 mark. You know the fact that in analytics. Younger players who are cheaper and productive, again, like we mentioned with Van Gundy discussion, that outperform their contract are far more valuable than a guy who you sign at 30, 31 years old, you might get a couple of decent years out of before the decline hits. Because with steroids supposedly out of the game, we don't have 36, 37-year-old guys hitting 40 home runs anymore. So I guess the question is, Greg, do you think there's collusion on tap here? Or do you think... Major League Baseball front offices are have become so analytics focused that they just don't see the value in giving a thirty year old JD Martinez as good as he is twenty five million dollars a year. Well, first of all, the the Red Sox have offered JD Martinez twenty five million dollars a year. The, 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 at least by what I've been what I've read is that Dave Dombrowski has a standing offer uh, for JD for which, five years. Which goes to show you he expected more. <laughs> for five, right for five yeah. years, one twenty-five. So th- that's out there. 
I don't know what the what the Diamondbacks, if anything, what what offer if any they have counter offer they've made to him, JD. But here's what I want to see. I, I I don't want to talk collusion yet. What I want to see happen. I want what I want to see play out. I should say, is next year because after this after the 2018 season, you've got Bryce Harper, you've got Manny Machado. And you've got Josh Donaldson. Those are the big three. They're going to be up for free agency at the end of the season. Now, if those guys don't get signed, <laughs> or if if there's, uh, it takes longer than you think to get those guys signed, then you can talk to me about about collusion because these are all guys that are young. Well, Donaldson's a little bit older, but Sully Machado and Harper are, are young. Yeah, they're and still, these, they're they're pretty much hitting their primes right now. And if if there are if there are Guys, Al, that you're gonna con- you're going to give out those eight to ten year contracts to like a la the Tigers with Cabrera and the Angels with Pujols. If if there if there's going to be a return to that, it's going to be with those guys. It's going to be with with Harper and Machado. Now, guys if, who aren't over thirty, aren't over they're not even close to thirty, yeah, exactly. and they and they've got uh, you know they're just mega stars. Okay, now. The other thing that's happening here, and you touched on it with with the uh, with the uh, analytics thing. If you look around baseball, the I'm I'm just you know except for in Detroit where we've got an old GM and an old manager, a lot of teams now are going with the model mm-hmm. of a younger manager and a younger GM. Yeah, the, these GMs Al across the baseball are in their thirties. Yeah, there are a lot of there are a lot of GMs. You look at the the guy over in Milwaukee. Uh, he looks like he's a looks like he's like still in college. Yeah, I mean it's uh, they, they're getting young. These executives are getting younger and younger. Managers are getting younger and younger. And big league managers now are being hired without having managed at any level of baseball in the past. Because why? One of the reasons why is what you touched on. Teams are really relying now on analytics and metrics, and um, the, that all speaks to the younger crowd. That all speaks yeah. to the younger. Uh, generation of baseball people, and and I think that does play into it. I I, mean, I really I you know l- let's look at a guy like JD Martinez for example. I love JD. I, I loved him when he was in Detroit. I love I, I love the story of how he was taken off the scrap heap by the Literally, Astros. Yeah. Right, and I like the fact that he that he you know I, I, he's a, he's a good story in terms of he can, but but the fact of the matter is he's only really had three. And he doesn't. He can't stay healthy. That's the other thing. Mm-hmm. He's only had three really full seasons in the big leagues, and, and a couple of those were marred by injury. And he's kind of a one-dimensional player. I mean, I've I've gone to bat for him in the past of, yeah. of that I don't think his his defense is as bad as people think it is. But he's not ever going to win a Gold Glove out there. Obviously, he's um, he's made for being a DH. Which event if he signs with the Red Sox, which might be why he's hesitant. By the way. To, hot, to sign with any American League team, frankly, is that he's might, he might be afraid that if he does so, that they're going to make him turn him into a DH in a couple yeah, of years. Yeah, he'll become the not, next Victor Martinez. And he doesn't want to do that. Even, well, if you look at – well, that's not such a bad deal, yeah, though. Exactly. It's not. Really. I mean, he could stay in the league for you – know, if, if he you, continued to hit, he'd be a productive player until he's well, in those late 30s. Look at Ortiz. Yeah, exactly. Good, you know, and I, that's I, looking what, more and more like Ortiz is the exception to the rule. It really well, is. It, it, yeah, it could be. It, it, well, it, it – it could be that, or it could be the start of a new rule. We don't know. I mean, they, we could may, maybe see. I mean, you're right that we haven't seen a lot of Edgar Martinez's and David Ortiz's yet, and the DH has been around for 45 years. I understand right. that, but you know, we may, you know, these things happen in trends. We may see, or you know, guys that just kind of. Well, I, that's that's irrelevant right now. The bottom line is that that this whole you you asked me about collusion. That was the, that was the question. I don't think that there's. That there's collusion. I think that there is um, just, just a wising up by some of these owners um, through their younger, more analytic-driven front offices to say, "Well, wait a minute now, hold on." And now the car, the Cubs just signed Darvish, which mm-hmm. you know, after what you saw in the World Series, I you know, yeah. I don't know sure that's such a great idea, mm-hmm. but they did it. But the Brewers went out and signed Kane. They went out and traded for Yelich. Uh, the Brewers are making some moves. They're making, trying to make some noise. The the, tw- the Twins have made it known they'd like to get somebody, sign somebody, but they, nobody nobody wants to go there. Right. I I'm not I'm not sold yet on collusion, Al. Until again, we see the Bryce Harpers and the Manny Machados next year when they hit the free market, open market. I submit to you because they are they are those players are 
analytics friendly players. Analytics loves those guys. So if yeah. those guys hit the market uh, this coming fall and there's there's no takers, I will be stunned. I'll bet you dollars to donuts that we're, you're going to see, just like you've always have, teams falling all over themselves to sign. Now, there won't be – when I say teams, it's only going to be – it's still going to be come down to the, the Dodgers, the the usual suspects. Yeah. You know, you're not going to – you're not going to get – the Cincinnati Reds signing Bryce Harper. You're not going to get the Minnesota Twins signing Manny Machado, but you are going to see the the, the typical big time deep pockets teams still have deep pockets. Um, I think what Tony Clark's beef is, to be president of the mm-hmm. Players Association, as you know, I think his beef is that it's not so much the the big ticket guys that he's not seeing signed. He's Tony's concerned. That some of these middle mid level guys, there's no aren't middle class signed. anymore. Right, those guys aren't getting their money, and that's what he's concerned about. Yeah, there's very few now, of those eight nine million dollar deals. Right now, you, if you go back to uh, Clark earlier this week, released a statement that really took the owners to task. He was accusing them of affecting the integrity of the game, and and that uh, you know there's an, all these players that are still unsigned, and I'm I, there's there's this been he called it conduct. The mm-hmm. conduct of these teams to not go all out and try to win. Well, hold on now. First of all, I don't. How come every time the owners go out and spend money like crazy and hand out these terrible contracts, nobody says boo? I don't hear anything from Tony Clark or anything from the Players Association when they do that. And they start to wise up a little bit and decide well, we're not going to give eight, nine-year contracts to a thirty-one-year-old player. Then mm-hmm. they squawk. Yeah. But I think I think that I I, I but I think that Tony's part of the argument that I think has some merit is he's concerned about. Because the big guys are always going to get their money. I mean, J.D. Martinez, is it's, it's, he's not going to set out the season. Somebody's going to sign him. And he's going to get $20, 25000000 million from somebody. But he's concerned about these, like you mentioned, those $8, 9000000 million contracts. Those are the ones that aren't really being signed. And those are the players that I think he's trying to look out for. Now, you and I can sit here and say, well, it's, you know, $8, 9000000 million is considered middle class. But in the in big leagues, the big league realm, it is. Yep. Yep, because uh, I think most teams, would, they would rather you know have a team full of Guys on rookie contracts, you know, before they hit free agency or at least are, are arbitration eligible, then have a hand, have a couple of big time guys who can put you over the top. And that's when you might see some of these deals come out, you know, get come out. But I think what also plays into it, you know, you brought up the lack of a middle class anymore, which the MLBPA could be to blame for that for you know agreeing to essentially a a hard soft a soft hard cap, I guess you could put it, salary cap with you know with the uh, with a pretty darn harsh penalty, if you you know when you go into luxury tax territory, which is why the Tigers scrambled back to get get away from it. There's also the fact that again, this I think this factors into how front offices are changing. Is that how many teams Greg, are actively actively spending and making moves to win? There are more and more teams that are essentially, I think, saying much like we see with the Tigers. Well, we could keep treading water and throwing money at guys and keep us at hovering at 500 and, like I said, maybe sneak into a wild card. Or would you rather take several steps back, maybe not be competitive for five years, but then have an actual chance to win a world title if you build a team correctly? I see, like, the White Sox are doing that. The Tigers are doing that. Uh, The Phillies want to go in that direction. The Reds want to go in that direction. Uh, How many? A ton of teams – are do are the Braves the Matt you know there's so many teams now that well that's what they want to do they're they're not going to spend to finish 500 or you know finish it you know with 82 83 84 wins they would rather pare down the payroll win you know win 70 and then hope for some draft picks to hit and then five years from now maybe then spend some bucks. I think that's also playing into this in a big way. I'm with you. I don't think it's all collusion. There might be something going on with that. I just think that front offices are getting smarter, and they're seeing contracts like Albert Pujols and Miguel Cabrera. You know, and I got to be honest. I was for the Cabrera deal, and that and that could still it could still end up well for the Tigers if he can rehab that back. But you know, Albert Pujols is a replacement level player now, and he's still under contract for four or five more years. Right. So I can see why. Front offices, as you mentioned, are getting younger and younger now. And a lot of these guys are big converts into sabermetrics. And sabermetrics says you don't pay big money to 31-year-old players for five years. Because you. Well, the big example, you know, we've seen with the Tigers, for example, is Victor Martinez. Yeah, He, he had a 
He finished second in the MVP race, had one of the best years of his career at the plate as a DH. And for some, you know, for who knows what reason, Mike Illich thought it was a good idea to overpay an aging DH with bad knees $18 million a year. Since he signed that contract, he's been below replacement level, except, you know, he's been either replacement level or below since he signed that contract. He's a negative war player now. That's what you're, we're not going to see anymore. We're not going to see guys in their 30s make big money anymore. And now, and the GD Matranias will likely ultimately get paid. He's just not going to get paid for the term he wants. I mean, if, if that five-year, $125 million deal is out there from the Red Sox, I can't believe he hasn't jumped on it at this point because I have a feeling those kind of deals are going to get fur, uh, farther and farther between because front offices are getting smarter. And, you know, you know, and the way to win today, especially with a soft, uh, a hard soft cap, whatever you want to call it, is you need guys to outperform the contract. And it's pretty hard for a 32-year-old who's making $20 million a year to outperform his contract. Well, the other thing too, uh, Al, is that, uh, that that Tony is concerned about, and, and there are a lot of baseball people that are concerned about, is that right now, as it stands right now, there are there are a lot of haves and have-nots in baseball. You mentioned you mentioned a bunch of them uh, yeah. a few minutes ago. There are a lot of teams that have no prayer. When they go to spring training this year, and I know that happens. I know that's I know that's the same every year in baseball. But there just seems to be a really wide gap now between the teams that are playoff contending and those that are not. You, you, I, we may see two or three teams this year lose ninety five to, to one hundred games this year, if not more. Yep. Um, and you'll see uh, you won't see too many of those teams in the seventies or in the low eighties. You'll see a lot of teams in the high sixties and and yep. below. And and I think that that's a that's a legitimate concern. I mean. Um, but you're right. If you're gonna if you're gonna go all in on the rebuild thing, you got to go all in. Now, well, the key though is knowing when. You mentioned a, uh, the other thing you said was you got to maybe spend some bucks on the line. Well, knowing when to do that is key. You know, if you remember the Tigers when they when they bottomed out in 2003, yeah. lost 119 games, and then they. Well, immediately they brought in Pudge, but then they they gradually added because they needed a they needed to bring somebody mm-hmm. uh, somebody to the team. Well, then they started it. You know, then they, then they brought in Maglio, and then they 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 got they started to add pieces. It's knowing when to sign to spend money. Anybody can dump salary. That's you and I can do that. I can yeah. I can trade contracts all day. Dump to just to dump salary, but beyond then you got to know. Then you got to hit, of course, on your player development. You got to hit on your draft picks, but you've got to know when. The time is right to start spending money again because it's it, the, the, your fan base is it, well, they'll they'll accept a, a, a rebuild for a year or two, but then they're going to want to start to see some 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 okay now we, now let's start to see let's try to let's try to get in on Machado or let's try to get in on Bryce Harper or I, I mean I know those are extreme those are extreme examples but I'm just saying sooner or later your fan base is not going to be content with winning 65 games every year and you keep telling them this is all part of the plan. Yeah. yeah, that's, yeah the process, the process. Like you the have to be yes. able to know when to spend some money and loosen up the purse strings. Anybody can dump salary. That's the easy part. The hard part is the player development, hitting on your draft picks and knowing when to, to go out there back out and test the waters again. And that's what we don't know yet can be done here in Detroit, and that's where we don't know it, it, whether it can be done in these other cities because there are a whole bunch of them right now, Al, mm-hmm. that are that are in either just starting rebuilds or are in the middle of them mm-hmm. or are teetering on whether or not they should do it. Yep. And you, you talk about Miami. They've got no prayer. Miami's going to lose 100, at least 100 games for sure. Yep. Cincinnati's got no prayer. The Phillies have no prayer, although they're getting better. Mm-hmm. The uh, the 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 um, um, White Sox, Tigers, White Sox don't have a prayer. On on, yeah. uh, the, the Braves don't have a prayer. Right. The Padres don't have a prayer. Mm-hmm. But, but but some of these teams though are trending up a little bit, and some of them, you know, when you look at teams like the Brewers and the Twins, that they, they kind of it, they kind of you know accelerated it a little yeah, bit. Yeah. For example, it would make sense for the Twins because there's three other teams in their division who. Who was essentially stink. throwing the white flag? <laughs> right. And essentially, them and a tribe. That's it. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And then uh, they're trying. I think they. I think they would. Lie. I think they were ready to spend some money. Yeah. I just don't think that they. They. Anybody wanted to to go. I, I know that they. They were. They wanted Darvish. 
I know they want a Darvish. Um, I know the Brewers want a Darvish. The Brewers need another starting pitcher. Mm-hmm. Uh, but g- give the Brewers credit. They went out and they signed Lorenzo Cain. You mentioned 30, you know, Cain's 30-31. Yeah. But they, only, but they only gave him five years, $80 million. That's not crazy. That's $16 million a year. Mm-hmm. Cain's a very good center fielder. He's a, he's a much better player than a lot of people give him credit for. Um, and yeah, he, he ticks more boxes than just offense. Yeah, that was a good that was a good signing, but they need more pitching in Milwaukee. But at least they're trying. At least they're at least they're trying to you know they're, they're they came real close last year to winning a getting a wild card spot, and so now they're they're um, they're they're trying to take that next step. Yep. Yeah, yeah, you're right. All these have nots now saying we're going to be the Astros. We're watch, you know, remember right. what they were like five years ago. That's the new model. The Cubbies yeah. as well. And you know, the thing is, so every you, you, you everything's got to go right. And then of course the Astros had to start spending. You know, like they picked up Justin Verlander's contract, for example. So, uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's going to – the fallout's going to be interesting from all this because I would not be surprised if there ends up being a court case about collusion. You know, and this and with this uh, offseason could make for a very militant MLBPA when the CBA comes up again, And if you know what I'm saying. So it could make for a very conscientious uh, – contentious no, – no, uh, <laughs> Uh, 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 negotiation when the CBA is due because of what's going on right now in that in a lot of ways the MLBPA screwed themselves by getting rid of the middle class you know and that's where the majority of uh, their membership is you know majority membership aren't superstars it's all young guys and and journeymen so but you know it's it's going to be a a fascinating uh, spring training to see where some of these guys ultimately end up and who's going to be the first guy to swallow his pride and take a short deal? You know, right? So we'll see what happens. All right, Greg, let's wrap up this podcast. We're running a little long as it is, as we started late. So, who's your jerk of the week? Uh, this is this is one of those weeks, Al, where I'm afraid that you and I might pick the same jerk of the week. We don't do it too often. In mm-hmm. fact, it rarely has ever happened. But this is one of those weeks where it was so high profile that I'm, that, and I, I'm, which makes this uh, at the same time low hanging fruit. Yeah. I understand that. But I gotta go with Josh McDaniels. I, yeah. I've gotta go with Josh McDaniels for backing out on the uh, on the uh, Colts, for but not just that, Al, mm-hmm. for hiring assistant coaches yep. on his staff who who had to turn in their resignations in some in some cases from their old teams to say I'm going with McDaniels to, to Indianapolis, and he then of course backs out because the Patriots sweeten his deal. He goes back to the Patriots, and now the Colts. Uh, initially, they came out and said they were going to that they were going to take care of or honor these contracts with these mm-hmm. assistants. We can't do that. Yeah, you can't. You can't uh, tell these guys that they're going to be hired by the new coach. That you can't do that. That was so. That and by the way, the Colts eventually hired Frank Reich, who was the offensive coordinator of the right. Eagles. They hired him today. But anyway. Uh, I, I just uh, that in, in McDaniel's was being killed throughout the, the NF, not just by the fans, but mm-hmm. by NFL people, by former players, by current people in, in the league, just completely raked over the coals as he should be for that ridiculous about face. Um, it, it was just, I, I, you know, that that the, the only thing that, that can make the people who are angry about this feel better is that I promise you that that will follow him. And mm-hmm. there, he'll, he'll come. That'll come back and haunt him. Believe me, it will. Oh, yeah. And he's—I mean—he's a young guy. He's not sixty-two years old. He's gonna—he's gonna find that that is gonna absolutely come back to haunt him. But my jerk of the week is Josh McDaniels. Yeah, you're right. Uh, essentially, Dick Daniel has thrown his career into the Pat's fold, and that's it. Who, no one would hire him as a head coach anyplace else at this point. Not for no. Let's don't even forget the disaster. It was uh, Denver in his two years there. So right. yeah, that's no. Since you took. McDaniel's, and that was the low hanging fruit. I'm going to go <laughs> with the uh, the hoary chestnut that we get every couple of years, and that'd be the Olympics, and specifically NBC's coverage of that, because that every two years people bitch deservedly so <laughs> over the coverage of the Olympics, specifically, and it's more noticeable here in Detroit, Greg, because we get the CBC, you know, right. and the CBC shows everything live. They don't, they rarely time shift stuff, and they tell you if they're doing it. <laughs> uh, you know, for the for example, uh, the, the U.S. won their first uh, medal in the Winter Olympics last night in the uh, 
uh, when it was a snowboard competition. I forgot, I sloped something or other. I don't even remember the name because I'm not, I'm not young and hip anymore. I'm not into the X game stuff, but this was, it was fun to watch. And I stumbled on it on the CBC right at the start. And there was three rounds, uh, you know, and the CBC showed every guy going down the slope, every round, every guy, and it got tenser and tenser. And it was actually exciting to watch. You know, the, the tension building up and, uh, of, of the competition, and it came down to the last few guys. You know, and, and, and obviously uh, Red Granger, the, the teenage American, who, I God, I'm getting old, when a 17-year-old is winning Olympics. He was born in 2000. Uh, he was the yeah. winner. And, you know, and the CBC had already shown the medal ceremony. And NBC hadn't even mentioned it or shown anything about it. When they finally did do it about an hour later, it was cut, sliced and diced. They only showed a handful of guys, you know. Uh, but it's typical for how NBC shows the Olympics. You know, if you really want to get the true uh, spirit or the feeling of the Olympics, you either have to watch uh, the online streams, which are awful as well. Because I was, I watched some of the, the NBC app on my Roku, and I'm in a little watching. And I'm laying in bed last night, you know, watching by half lot of all things. You no, know, because I enjoy it. You know, you only get to see this stuff every four years, and. In the middle of the competition, a commercial comes on. No break or anything. They just slap a commercial in there, and then they come back. Because because uh, the fees they're using on the apps are Olympic live feeds that aren't designed for commercials. So they just slap them in there wherever, no matter what's going on in the competition. So between getting to see how the CBC does the coverage every two years when it comes to the Olympics, both summer and winter, and how NBC butchers it. And let's not even forget... Uh, during the uh, which this came today because NBC actually had to apologize to South Korea because during the <laughs> uh, opening ceremony, their their their, their Asian expert characters you know, said uh, didn't realize that Korea was was occupied by Japan for 35 years and, and said Japan essentially was a positive influence on Korea, you know, up to World War II which then was hugely offensive to South Korea. And, you know, to say something like that, when you're oh, able to say that, oh, yeah, our, uh, our occupying forces that raped our women and used us for forced labor was a positive influence. Well, that pretty much says it all about NBC and the coverage and their know-nothing coverage. I mean, I like guys like Mike Chirico and some of the other guys they're using. They are just kneecapping them with this ridiculous, touchy-feely, carved-up coverage. So I'm going back to the CBC to watch the Olympics so I crawl in the bed tonight, and you, and you guys should too. So that's my jerk of the week. NBC for their annually butchering Olympics coverage. Because if you want to enjoy sports, I don't need it fed to me with a spoon like NBC does. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm tired of ranting. I've been ranting all night tonight. Okay, right. well. Anything else, Greg? No, uh, let's just uh, say that uh, you can uh, follow the Nitrix on Twitter at the Nitrix. Follow me on Twitter at Greg Eno. Uh, read me at uh, my Out of Bounds uh, blog on WordPress and also my Wing Wheeler Red Wing blog on WordPress. Uh, check me out on, um, or check the Nitrix out, I'm sorry, on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash the Nitrix, and also check out our Nitrix group. I want to thank my lovely wife, Sharon, and thank you, Big Al, for making Sunday Night So Gosh on Fun. Well, first off, I want to thank Carlos Monarez for giving us some great topics to talk about tonight. And so, same for NBC. <laughs> and, of course, you, Greg, for taking time on your busy schedule to talk sports with me. Stay up, uh, record a little later than we usually do. So, uh, so thanks again. I want to give a shout-out to Linda, who's working tonight, busy saving lives in the ER. And I apologize for not talking to any Red Wings, because if I had talked about the Red Wings and their penalty kill, all oh, like this podcast would last three hours. So we'll mm-hmm. save that for another time. Anyway, with that, let's get the hell out of here. So, until uh, this time, two weeks from now, and I'm sure we'll have more to rant about, and rave, hopefully, this is Al Beaton saying, yeah, I forgot my damn sign-off, I'm so wound up, so I'll just say aloha. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao, Italy, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks on February 25th. Thanks.